Today we're going to move on uh, and continue our topic in Chapter 1, looking at uh, defining biology and looking at the characteristics of life. So last time we defined biology as a scientific study of life, and we certainly spent quite a bit of time talking about the scientific study portion of that definition, talking about our scientific method, our experimental design, getting that reliable, repeatable data. Today I want to focus on the other part of that definition, that's the idea of life. And life is one of those really interesting words because it's obviously a pretty simple concept. We all know what's alive and what's dead, or we can tell what's life versus non-life. But because there's so much diversity of life, it's often hard to come up with a nice one or two line definition that encompasses everything. What do you have in common, for example, with a single-celled bacteria that maybe only lives a few hours? Or what does that bacteria ha in turn have in common with a giant redwood tree that maybe lives 2,000, uh, 2,500 years old? And so it's not an easy thing to define life. And so what I'd like to do, rather than try to define it, is I'd like you to take a minute here and make a list of characteristics. And in particular, make a list of characteristics that are shared by all living things. So what are some uh, characteristics that all living things must do to be alive? Okay? In turn, those characteristics should be absent in non-living things. Okay? So what are those characteristics that really do define or make something alive? For example, if we think about it, the first thing that jumps into the head is uh, carbon. We know all living things are made of carbon, so maybe carbon should be on our list, but realize carbon is also found in the air and in rocks, and so carbon is uh, not absent from non-life. So we would not uh, use carbon on our list. It really doesn't separate life from non-life. So what I want you to do is make this list don't look at your book. I know what the book says. I want to know what you think, just kind of off the top of your head. So just make a rough list uh, and go ahead and pause the presentation while you make your list. And then once you have your list, you can go ahead and start the presentation again. One thing that you'll see after you have your list made here is that it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, what do all living things have in common? Again, it's pretty difficult because of that diversity of life. And so I'm going to go through my list of uh, characteristics of life, and you can compare that and sort of check off the ones that you might have on your list. Probably the best place to start as we start thinking about these characteristics of life is what's called the cell theory. Now, first of all, we see that word theory, and remember, we don't use it very often in science. Theory is that hypothesis that we've tested hundreds of times we take as scientific fact. And so uh, this is one of the few ideas that we've really thoroughly tested that we have enough confidence in uh, that we uh, have studied it for hundreds of years here. And so in the cell theory, it tells us three basic aspects. And a couple of these are going to impact directly on our characteristics characteristics of life that we're talking about here. The first part of the cell theory is that all living things are composed of cells. And this is probably as close to a definition of life as we can come up with. So you might want to put an asterisk by this one. All living things are composed of cells. Now, if all living things are composed of cells, what's the smallest living organism that we can have? Well, obviously, that would be one cell. And so that's kind of our second part, our second corollary here with the cell theory, is that the smallest unit capable of carrying out all the process of life is a single-celled organism. And then our last part of the cell theory here uh, is all cells come from pre-existing cells. And so we all started off as a single cell when that sperm and egg fused together to make a zygote. Today, as adults, we're made up of over a trillion cells. And so our cells, have our cells today have come from those pre-existing cells as cells grow and divide and reproduce. And because cells are such an integral part of living organisms, we're certainly going to spend a lot of time this semester talking about cells, what is a cell, what makes up a cell, how do cells work. And several chapters in the book, especially here in the first portion of the class, will be dealing with cells. If we just take a quick look, though, there's certainly a lot of cell diversity out there in terms of different types of cells. Uh, here we see some bacteria cells. Cell uh, is a tiny little pill-shaped cell, so we've probably got 40 or 50 cells here in this little shot. We have a typical uh, protist. This is kind of an animal-like single-celled organism. You can see the hairy cilia on the outside. Those things uh, beat and allow it to swim around. It's a typical thing we might find in pond water, for example. Here we see some diatoms. These diatoms are, have a glass or a silica-like outer coating there, and they're photosynthetic or green on the inside, and they, see they have this sort of odd shape which allows them to be better at floating. Here we have some more photosynthetic cells. This is actually a group of about eight cells, all growing in this uh, kind of uh, octagonal sort of pattern. And so lots of different cell types and cell shapes, really an incredible diversity out there. But the one thing that all living things have in common is living things are made up of at least one cell and oftentimes more than one cell.
Now the rest of the items on your list in terms of your characteristics of life, we can kind of break down into different categories. And I think sticking these characteristics in categories really helps to uh, remember some of these different categories and also kind of mentally sort them out in terms of how they're related to each other. Some of these characteristics of life have to do with metabolism, kind of getting energy and getting food. Some of these processes uh, have to do with generation of new material. Some of these characteristics may have to do with response to the world around the living organism. And finally, there are a whole slew of control uh, characteristics as well. And so what we're going to do is take a look at each of these uh, categories and what are some of the characteristics that fit into them. And hopefully with your list, we can see where some of your different characteristics fit in. So we'll start with metabolism. And I think when we think of metabolism, we think of energy and food. And certainly all these things do apply in terms of metabolism. Uh, the number one metabolic uh, characteristic living things do is to take in nutrients. Now, many things that might need some nutrients. My lawnmower needs gas to run. My car has to have gasoline to run. So it needs nutrients. But what makes life different is living things have the ability to identify and take in those nutrients, to be able to acquire that nutrient. Now, what do we call a nutrient is extremely variable depending on what type of organism we might be looking at. It might be food, it might be minerals from the soil, it may be sunlight if it's a plant, or it may actually be some sort of food product. And so lots of different uh, nutrients out there. Also, lots of different ways organisms may try to acquire or take up those nutrients. But all living things must be able to take up nutrients in some way. Another characteristic here in metabolism is once organisms have our nutrients, we process those nutrients. We have a very complex uh, metabolic pathway or chemical pathways in our cells where we're going to process those nutrients. Maybe some of them we're going to break down and recycle. Others maybe we're going to use for energy. Still other nutrients maybe we're just going to save up and use, utilize them at a different time. And then finally within our metabolism, we also have elimination of waste. This nutrient processing generates lots of waste products. Living things have to be able to constantly remove those waste products. Otherwise, those waste products may uh, become toxic if organisms can't get rid of them. And the one common theme we see here with uh, metabolism is it really involves taking in nutrients and taking in energy and then being able to utilize that energy uh, that came from an outside source. Another category where some of these characteristics characteristics of life fit in has to do with generation, in particular generating new cells. And so living things uh, have the potential for growth, growing new cells, repair, and that's one that oftentimes doesn't make people's list, is to be able to uh, fix or heal. Again, there might be damage so severe that the organism can't fix it, but in general they have that potential to try to repair by growing new healthy cells to replace those that were killed off or maybe damaged. And then finally reproduction, producing cells. Uh, eggs or sperm cells, for example, to produce th the next generation. And the one thing we see that uh, many of these ca characteristics have in common is they involve spending some energy. So as where metabolism is going to be taking in energy, generation characteristics are going to typically involve spending or utilizing some of that energy. A third category of your characteristics, then, is the response idea, the idea that living things aren't inanimate objects. Life is not like the desk you're sitting at uh, that's not going to move and not going to respond. But instead, living organisms are going to constantly respond to their environment and interact with their surrounding environment. And so if the environment changes, living organisms typically then will change. Now, life is going to respond not just to changes in the living part of the environment, but also non-life. If the weather changes, for example, uh, living organisms are going to respond to that change. Now, how an organism responds or how quickly it responds or to what change that organism may respond to, again, is going to be really variable. And typically when we think of response, maybe we think of an animal. If the sun's out, it's really hot, an animal can get up and move to the shade, for example. Uh, but all organisms do this. And I, my example I always think about is something like uh, the hanging baskets in above the uh, sink and by the kitchen window. Okay? Um, if you put that basket in front of the window, it's going to grow toward the sunlight. So if you come back and look at it in a couple weeks, you'll see the plants growing kind of lopsided. So every once in a while, you have to kind of rotate that plant. Well, the plant is responding to its environment. It's growing toward that light. Now, you may stare at that plant all day. You're not going to see that leaf actually sort of turn. Because the response is so slow, we're not going to perceive that movement. Uh, but despite the fact that the response is slow, those living organisms, that plant does certainly respond to its environment. Last on our list here in terms of our categories are characteristics that would fall into this category of control. Um, and one thing we see comparing life versus non-life is living things are extremely structured, extremely organized, extremely complex. And so when we think of a living organism, living organisms aren't just randomly taking in nutrients or spending energy or responding. 
but it's a very controlled and regulated process. Which nutrients are going to be taken in? How much? How much energy should the organism spend on growing versus repairing versus maybe how much energy is spent responding to the environment? And so again, it's a very sort of controlled aspect. Certainly DNA plays a central role in this, and all living things use DNA as that control chemical that's going to determine the metabolism that's occurring within a cell. Another important concept that you may not be familiar with here with this control aspect is a term called homeostasis. And I just want to bring this term up because it is important in how living things function. And homeostasis refers to the idea that living organisms attempt to maintain a consistent internal chemical environment. So again, if we let that sink in a little bit, organisms attempt to maintain a consistent internal environment. And so if the outside environment is changing around an organism, that organism is going to respond to that change trying to maintain the internal environment, make it consistent inside. Uh, and examples of that, if we think of humans, our body temperature, we maintain a constant body temperature at 98.6. If it's really cold outside and our body temperature starts to get too low, our body responds by shivering, trying to warm it back up. Likewise, if it's a really hot summer day and your body temperature starts to get too high, your body responds by sweating, trying to cool itself off. And so if an internal system gets out of whack, living organisms exhibit homeostasis. They try to bring it back to its normal condition as quickly as possible. Now, as we look at life and these characteristics of life, there are certainly many, many different levels that we can study living organisms. And if we look at the chart here, if we start at the bottom, we can certainly study organisms at the level of the DNA or the chemical level. Or if we move our way up, we can study individual cells within an organism, different cell types. For example, as humans, we're made up of over a di 100 different types of cells. Our cells make up tissues, so we can study different tissues, like nervous tissue or skin tissue. It's combined to make organs, so we can study a whole organ, like your heart or your brain or your kidney. Likewise, we could study a whole organism. So all those different organs have to work together to produce a whole organism. Okay? Um, but even above the whole organism level, we could study groups of organisms. How do different members of a species all interact? And how do they behave, for example, during mating season or react in terms of competing with one another? Uh, that would be sort of looking at the population level. Or we can even go steps higher than that. We can look at a community, which is the interaction of many different species with each other. Uh, also, if we look at a ne the next level up, the ecosystem level, that would be looking at how these different species not only interact with each other, but how do they interact with the environment, their non-living part of their uh, ecosystem as well. And so many, many different levels we can study life. Now, as we've listed these characteristics of life so far, they all fa fall under the level of the individual. Because that's kind of how I phrased uh, the question about making the list, is how the individual have to do to be alive versus non-life. But there are characteristics of life at other levels. And in particular, I want to make that comparison and look at characteristics of life, especially at the population or the group level. So as we just mentioned then, we've studied uh, living things at the organismal level in terms of our characteristics of life discussed so far. So that cell theory, our metabolism, generation, response, control, those all fit under the category of the organismal level. What does an organism have to do to be alive? Our other major characteristic of life, then, is going to be at that population level. And when we think of a population, that's simply the group of the same species that's living in a particular area. And as we look at organisms out there in nature, we don't see organisms typically kind of evenly spread out all over the place. But instead, they tend to live in small groups or populations uh, where the habitat is suitable for them. And our main characteristic of life at the population level is evolution, that living populations evolve. And because this is a characteristic of life, I want to talk a little bit about evolution in terms of evolution as a basic process and how it works. And certainly, uh, it's a very central theme in biology today. We know that evolution impacts many aspects of our life, including t treating diseases and medicine, dealing with crops and growing food, many, many different aspects here. And one of the keys about evolution is that evolution is going to result in adaptations in specific organisms. So I want to take a moment and look at these adaptations. So one of the most amazing things about living organisms is how well adapted or how well suited they are to survive in their environment. And adaptation is just any sort of trait, whether it's a physical trait or a behavioral trait, that allows the organism to have a better chance to survive and eventually reproduce and pass on its genes in its environment. And by far, one of the most common adaptations we see in organisms is camouflage. And so example here, we're going to look at several Arctic animals, whether it's the Arctic owl, the polar bear, the snow fox, uh, or even an arctic wolf, one of the common things we see here is obviously they're all white. They all tend to blend in with their environment because organisms that do blend in with their environment have a better chance to survive and or reproduce. And it's again, 
these organisms aren't white because they want to be white, but the organisms that can produce this white fur tend to survive better and then reproduce and pass on their genes more often than organisms that cannot. And I know there are oftentimes many misconceptions about evolution or what evolution is or what it means, and so I just want to look at some very basic principles of evolution and how it works. And the most important aspect of evolution is evolution is a change in a population. And in particular, our population is going to change over time. Evolution is not about individuals. And we kind of change our scale. We talked about characteristics of life at that organism or individual level. Evolution is a characteristic life at that group or that population level. So averages in populations change due to evolution. Individuals do not change. And there's lots of causes for evolution or forces that might cause this change. You're probably most familiar with natural selection. And here's our basic definition of natural selection, that individuals with favored traits are going to pass on more copies of their genes than those with less favorable traits. All else being equal, if you have traits that give you some sort of advantage in your environment, you're going to have a better chance to survive and pass on the genes for those traits. If you have traits that put you at a disadvantage, you're probably not going to be able to survive. You're probably not going to have a chance to pass those genes on. Another important concept within evolution is that all species are related to each other. That when we look at species, we all have a genetic link. Some species are very close relatives. They have a lot in common in terms of their DNA and their physical and maybe behavioral features. Other species may be very distant relatives and have very, very little in common. I want to take a moment and look uh, more specifically at natural selection here. Now, as the semester progresses, we're going to hit on evolution uh, here and there because, again, it is a central theme, so we're going to mention it along the way. Uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about evolution at the end of the course, but I do want to go over some of these basics so that we're familiar with them as we come across them. And certainly natural selection is the major force that drives or causes evolutionary change. And the idea is that all individuals have variation, that not every individual out there is the same, and some individuals are going to have favorable traits, meaning they're going to have those traits that give them an advantage or a better chance to survive in their particular environment. And so individuals that have those favorite traits then are going to have a higher survival rate and in turn a higher reproductive rate. They're going to be passing on lots of copies of genes for those favorite traits. Which means next generation, I would expect to see even more of those favorite traits because those are the genes that were being passed on and the traits that are putting organisms at a disadvantage are not going to be passed on very often because organisms that have those traits are not going to survive and reproduce very often. So what we expect with natural selection is that uh, each generation we should see more and more individuals that have traits that are favored by the environment or give those organisms an advantage in their particular environment. So let's take a look at an example here. So let's look at a population in this case of mice. I'll be honest, I'm a little colorblind so I apologize if my colors are different than yours here. Uh, but we have this kind of purplish gray kind of background here and we can see in our population of mice we've got several that are purple and some that are brown or kind of this brownish green and so our original population we've got six of each mice so half the population is purple and half the population is brown and so our different traits here are going to be color favorable or not favorable which traits are going to put organisms at advantage has to do with the environment in this case because the background is purple those organisms that are purple are going to be blending in they're going to be camouflaged they're going to be harder to see so they're going to have an advantage in this case so then as we apply natural selection some of these mice are camouflaged and have favored traits the purpled ones and some are easy to see the brown or the green ones here and so if there's a predator that comes along the predator obviously from a distance is going to see those brightly colored mice first and they're more likely then to get predated upon, to be eaten. And in fact, uh, over time, we might expect this to occur at a very high rate. So over this long period of time, then what we're going to see is predators are preferentially going to be selecting the mice that are easy to see, because those are going to be the ones they're going to see from a longer distance away. Those are the mice that then are going to be eaten. And so what we'll see with natural selection, and very quickly, is that we're going to get fewer and fewer of these brown mice, whereas the purple mice are going to have a higher chance to survive. So that after the predators have kind of done their damage, what we see here in our population is almost all the mice are purple, and maybe we've only got one or two brown ones left, maybe none, depending on how much predation is going on. And so this is evolution by natural selection. My population has changed. 
I've now got mostly purple in my population, whereas before it was kind of 50-50, half purple and half brown. Now, if we think about how natural selection works, and we ask the question, well, why did the purple mice have the advantage? What's causing or driving natural selection? Again, I think there are a lot of misconceptions sometimes, and in particular, I think sometimes we're kind of anthropomorphic, and we try to put our human emotions or human conscious thoughts onto things that aren't having conscious thoughts or necessarily having emotions. And so... It's not that the purple mice wanted to survive, and that's why they did, because obviously the brown mice were trying to survive as well. It's not that the purple mice needed to survive, that they had the advantage, because again, all the mice, regardless of color, probably wanted and needed or tried to survive. Okay? Uh, and it's not that mice could try to blend in and that uh, a brown mice could turn purple or a purple one would turn brown. Again, the individuals in this case are not changing. What's changing is my population, and the advantage that purple mice have isn't an advantage because the purple mice want to have an advantage or need to have that advantage, but instead the purple mice have the advantage because of the environment. It's the environment then, that background is purple, that determines if a trait is an advantage or a disadvantage. Okay? And so in this case, because our environment was purple, the purple color had the, was a favorable trait, it had the advantage. Over time we expect to see more and more purple mice in our population. And just to kind of drive home that point that it's not about the mice themselves, but it's really about the environment. Nature is doing the selecting. What if our environment changed? Maybe we've got this background where the purple mice are blended in, but the environment changes. And all of a sudden now, uh, the mice that are the green or the brown colored have an advantage here. If that were the case, then over time what we would expect is now the purple ones are easy to see, and so they're going to be eaten over time, and the brown ones are not. They're going to have a better chance to survive, a better chance to reproduce. So over time, we're going to expect then to see these uh, green or brown mice have a high reproductive rate. The purple ones are going to be eaten as fast as they're reproducing. So over time, we're going to end up with a population that has more of the uh, brown or green mice and fewer and fewer of the purple mice. And so in this case, our population has changed. Again, an individual hasn't changed, but our population as a whole is gradually changing. And that's, again, the crux of how natural selection works. Another important prediction about evolution is that it predicts organisms are going to be related to each other. And just like with your family, we could draw a family tree about how you're related to other members of your family, we can do the similar thing with species. And so, for example, if we said two species are close relatives, and if we look at this chart, this is just looking at several species of finch, uh, we would say that large ground finch there on the left is a close relative of the medium ground finch. And what we mean by close relative is that if we go back in time, historical time, generation after generation, we see that they share a common genetic genetic link or a common genetic ancestor. Uh, very similar to if I said you and your brother are close relatives. It doesn't mean your brother came from you or you came from your brother, but obviously if I go back just one generation, I find your common genetic link. Okay? And just like we expect close relatives to have a lot in common in terms of maybe a family resemblance or in terms of your DNA, we accept, expect the same thing for species. And just like we can do kind of the who's a daddy paternity test today to find out uh, how people are related, we can look at species and do the same sort of test to see how species are related. Now, some species may be very distant relatives. For example, that large ground finch is also related to that warbler finch way over there on the right side of the chart. But we would say they're very distant relatives because if we follow those blue lines to where they connect from each species, it's very, very distant in the past. And so they're very distant relatives, which means they may have a few things in common, but they have a lot of differences as well. Just like if I compared you to some second cousin somewhere maybe that you share a great-grandmother with that you've never met. You might have a little bit in common, but probably not too much. Here's a similar uh, example looking at different species of bears, and what we oftentimes do then is draw these what are called evolutionary trees, again very similar to a family tree, uh, showing how different species are related to each other, who are close relatives and who are distant relatives. In this case within the bears, the panda is the most distant relative, it's the most different from all those other bears. So just to wrap up uh, with our topic today, it's very, very difficult to define life. So instead of defining life, we often talk about characteristics of life. What are some things that living organisms have to do? And at that individual level, we said individuals are composed of cells, uh, that in, uh, individuals have metabolic characteristics, generative characteristics, response and control characteristics. And then at that population level, living populations evolve or change over time.